Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. of a true faith to acknowledge the glory of the eternal trinity and in the power of your divine majesty to worship the unity keep us steadfast in this faith and worship and bring us at last to see you in your one and eternal glory O father who with the son and the holy spirit live and reign one god forever and ever amen reading from the first chapter of the book of Genesis. In the beginning, when God created the heavens and the earth, the earth was a formless void, and darkness covered the face of the deep, while a wind from God swept over the face of the waters. Then God said, Let there be light, and there was light. And God saw that the light was good, and God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning, the first day. And God said, Let there be a dome in the midst of the waters, and let it separate the waters from the waters. So God made the dome and separated the waters that were under the dome from the waters that were above the dome. And it was so. God called the dome sky, and there was evening, and there was morning, the second day. And God said, Let the waters under the sky be gathered together into one place, and let the dry land appear. And it was so. God called the dry land earth, and the waters that were gathered together he called seas. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, Let the earth put forth vegetation, plants yielding seed and fruit trees of every kind on earth that bear fruit with the seed in it. And it was so. The earth brought forth vegetation, plants yielding seed of every kind, and trees of every kind bearing fruit with the seed in it. And God saw that it was good. And there was evening, and there was morning, the third day. And God said, 
Let there be lights in the dome of the sky to separate the day from the night, and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years, and let them be lights in the dome of the sky to give light upon the earth. And it was so. God made the two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night and the stars. God set them in the dome of the sky to give light upon the earth, to rule over the day and over the night, and to separate the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good, and there was evening and there was morning the fourth day. And God said, Let the waters bring forth swarms of living creatures, and let birds fly above the earth across the dome of the sky. So God created the great sea monsters and every living creature that moves of every kind with which the waters swarm, and every winged bird of every kind. And God saw that it was good. God blessed them, saying, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the waters in the seas, and let birds multiply on the earth. And there was evening, and there was morning, the fifth day. And God said, Let the earth bring forth living creatures of every kind, cattle and creeping things and wild animals of the earth of every kind, and the cattle of every kind, and everything that creeps upon the ground of every, of every kind. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, Let us make humankind in our own image according to our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the wild animals of the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. So God created humankind in his image. In the image of God he created them. Male and female he created them. God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful, and multiply, and fill the earth, and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves upon the earth. God said, See, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is upon the face of all the earth, and every tree with seed in its fruit. You shall have them for food. And to every beast of the earth, and to every bird of the air, and to everything that creeps on the earth, Everything that has the breath of life, I have given every green plant for food. And it was so. God saw everything that he had made, and indeed it was very good. And there was evening, and there was morning, the sixth day. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all their multitude. And on the seventh day God finished the work that he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all the work that he had done. So God blessed the seventh day and hallowed it, because on it God rested from all the work that he had done in creation. These are the generations of the heavens and the earth when they were created. This is the word of the Lord.
A reading from 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 11 through 13. Finally, brothers and sisters, farewell. Put things in order, listen to my appeal, agree with one another, live in peace. And the God of love and peace will be with you. Greet one another with a holy kiss, and all the saints greet you. The grace of Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with all of you. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Matthew. Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. The Gospel of the Lord. Good morning, friends. I've been asked to give a mini lecture this morning on the Trinity as we celebrate Trinity Sunday. I'm gonna to try to err on the side of mini rather than lecture because I know this isn't a typical feature of our worship service. And I don't wanna make it any harder than it already is to maintain a spirit of worship during these strange times. 
In actual fact, every Sunday at our church is Trinity Sunday, inasmuch as this belief, this mystery, structures everything that we do. The language of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit is in all of our colics and prayers. We confess it in the creed. It's inscribed in the very form of our sacraments, in the way that we baptize, in the way that we receive the Eucharist. Even if we're not sure what to make of it, we are imbibing this language and this doctrine all the time. It's good, however, to try to make explicit our beliefs from time to time, to wrestle with them. And that's what Trinity Sunday asks us to do, not to solve this mystery, but to engage with it directly, to startle ourselves with it once more. In my own thinking, I try to steer a course between what I call excessive chattiness about the Trinity, that is, speech that's just a little too confident about the inner workings of the divine life, and excessive silence, which regards it as a bit of arcane arithmetic, to be grudgingly acknowledged, preferably as little as possible. Indeed, the Trinity is perhaps best approached not as a doctrine at all, but as a reality to grow into, a mystery to inhabit with our lives, a form that we are invited to partake in, in our worship and in our prayer. The French philosopher Gabriel Marcel says that a mystery, unlike a mere problem, is something that grows as one engages with it. A problem disappears once it is solved, but a mystery is a reality that involves the one who is considering it. It takes that person in and changes him or her, such that it can never grow old, but only ever become new. And as I understand it, the doctrine of the Trinity is a mystery in precisely this sense. It's not to be understood, at least not as a problem is understood, but to be lived. It's a mystery we are invited to enter into, to be conformed to Christ by means of the Holy Spirit within us, and thus to become sons and daughters of the Father. That is the goal of the Christian life. So what I'd like to do is to look at this mystery for just a few more minutes this morning, and to do that, I'd like to look at the Nicene Creed. We're gonna be saying this creed together a little bit later in the service, and I thought it would be useful to look at it a bit more closely, perhaps with fresh eyes. The Nicene Creed is, in fact, a battle-scarred document. Nearly every line of the creed hides within it a debate that roiled the early church, sometimes for long periods of time. Not a single word is wasted on what might be called fluff. Take, for example, the first section about the Father, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is, seen and unseen. Seems straightforward enough, pretty unobjectionable, there is a source to all things. Atheism wasn't common in the ancient world, and so one might think that this part of the creed is less a statement of belief, less something that requires an act of faith, and more like a common starting point, a safe place to begin. But it wasn't at all clear to some in the ancient world that the world is the product of a good God, a father. Indeed, the idea that the world originates from a good source is not self-evident at any time. It's as easy to question it now as it was then. The world is full of pain. It seems at times to lack any moral order. In these days, it seems more like a chaos than a cosmos. And for this reason, certain ancient Gnostic sects argued that the world must be the work of an inferior deity, sometimes even a malevolent one, and that the true God is hidden far beyond this world, known by only a handful of initiates. To insist on the contrary, as the creed does, that the world is the creation of a good God, a father, not of rival deities, not of demonic powers, is to commit to the idea at, that at bottom, the world is good, that it's worth fighting for, that every part of it is redeemable. And it's to maintain that everything that contradicts this claim, and there's so much that does, must be explained in some other way 
as a deviation from the plot, as a side story in a far deeper, far more beautiful narrative. And this requires true faith. Indeed, practically speaking, these very first lines of the creed may be the hardest part to maintain faith in throughout the ups and downs of our lives. And yet when we believe them, when we believe that a father is behind it all, that goodness is the bottommost note of the world, we're able to gain confidence when we're fearful and to find boldness when we are weak. And we are committed to making that goodness visible and audible in our own lives. The section of the creed that deals with the sun is by far the longest, the center that radiates outward in both directions. It could be said that confession of these lines is what makes a person Christian and not something else. More theological energy was spent debating the status of the sun than any other point in the history of Christian thought. Indeed, it was divergent beliefs about the sun and the divisions that they were creating throughout the Roman Empire that led to the convening of the Council of Nicaea in the first place. That was the matter the bishops of the Christian world were called together to resolve. And yet it could easily be argued that the creed simply ratifies, gives technical language to, a belief that goes back to the very beginning. That's because from the very start, people were worshiping Jesus as Lord, calling upon him as Savior, praying in and baptizing in his name. It isn't true that people initially followed Jesus as a great moral teacher and that later followers, in an effort to elevate his status, deified him. There's no layer in any of our sources that supports that view. Even before they had the language to make sense of what they were doing, the early Christians were attributing to Jesus Christ the activities and qualities of God. And so what this means then is that the Nicene Creed is best understood as a language or a grammar developed after the fact to articulate this belief. Indeed, it's a perfect example of the concept of lex orandi, lex credendi. The law of prayer is the law of belief. The idea that what people say and do precedes the technical vocabulary given to it by theologians. The creed is the best effort of the theological minds of the day to make sense of the dual conviction that Jesus is Lord and Savior and that God is at the same time one. All of the initial language of this second section of the creed is aimed at establishing Jesus' divinity, God from God, light from light, and if that's not enough, true God from true God, begot not made. There are debates in the background of each one of these phrases, but the upshot is that the Son is fully, completely, unequivocally divine without qualification. He's not God light. He's not God in low-key divine mode. He's not some intermediary or hybrid between creator and creature. There were many such beings in the ancient cosmos, but the Son we're being told here is not one of them. Indeed, all such things exist because of him, through him, excuse me, through whom all things were made. The Son is homo usias with the Father, which means of one substance or of one being with the Father. Whatever the Father is, that's what the Son is also, as my middle daughter would say, period. And the reason this matters so much is that only God can save. Call the problem what you will, sin, death, evil, existential weariness, sorrow, despair. Only God stands beyond the things that afflict us in such a way that God can deliver us from them. And thus, if Jesus is to be Lord and Savior to us, then he must be God. Put another way, if Jesus is not God, he is not Lord and Savior. He's a creature like you and me. And it takes no convincing for us to know that we cannot be Lord and Savior to one another. 
a superhero can save us from this disaster or that disaster so that we live to fight another day, but only God can transform our very condition. At the same time, and as the very means of doing this, the creed claims that this only begotten Son was made man, that for us and for our salvation, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary. So not only is he beyond the world, but he enters into the world, becomes subject to its ambiguity and its pain. The creed doesn't specify how this occurs, and the following century witnessed some truly ugly debates surrounding that topic. Here it's sufficient to note that the creed affirms unequivocally also that Christ was human, that he shared our lot, that he was embodied as we are, that he lived in time. Obviously, this is communicated in the claim that he was made man and in the reference to his mother. But it is also made clear in an interesting way by the mention of the governor, Pontius Pilate, who eventually oversaw his death. Pilate wasn't a particularly good governor of Judea. He likely would have been forgotten to history were his name not repeated Sunday after Sunday, year after year, all over the world. It's unclear why the early Christians felt it important to include his name in their statement of faith. But one thing that it accomplishes is to secure this story a place in the real world, a place on our timeline. It is no myth. It is no event that occurred in illo tempore, in the primordial past, but one that can be dated, researched, debated, questioned. In Christ, the creed claims, God chooses to be subject to every aspect of human existence, birth, death, burial. In Christ, the one through whom all things were made chooses to enter into history. And he chooses to do this, we're told, for us and for our salvation. But this is left unspecified by the creed. How exactly does Christ save us? What does he do? Notice that nothing is said about Christ's life or Christ's deeds, nothing of the disciples. Though if we read between the lines, we can learn something of how Christ was regarded by the authorities, by the specific form of execution they used against him. How Christ died tells us a good bit about how Christ lived, for the cross was reserved for specific kinds of criminals. Other things, too, in this second section are given the brief, briefest of mentions, the resurrection, the ascension to heaven, Christ's coming again in glory. There sometimes seems almost a yada, yada, yada quality to these last lines. But of course, these weren't the beliefs that were being debated at Nicaea. Indeed, it was these beliefs so firmly believed in that made the working out of the doctrine of the Trinity necessary. In its original form, the creed stopped here. All but two of the approximately 222 bishops in attendance at Nicaea signed the text. And the expectation was that one's willingness to confess this creed would henceforth be the criterion by which to measure one's orthodoxy. A kinder way of putting this is that only those who confess the contents of this creed can be said to be speaking the same language. And much of the point of the Council of Nicaea was to make sure that Christians, when they argue and debate and teach and question, are doing so in a common language. The section about the Holy Spirit was added at the Second Ecumenical Council, which was held some 50 plus years later at Constantinople in 381. Some had argued against the full divinity of the Spirit alongside the Father and the Son, objecting to the description of the Spirit as yet another person or mode of being of God. But the debates were far less vociferous than they had been about the Son, and hence the relative quickness of that section. The Spirit, too, is Lord and giver of life. With the Father and the Son, the Spirit is worshipped and glorified. From the beginning, Christians had baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. 
They experienced the Spirit as the power by which God extends life to them, and indeed to the whole world. If an argument needed to be made as to why the Spirit too is divine, it is simply this. The Spirit is the source of life, and only God gives life. We see this life-giving activity of the Spirit first in the book of Genesis, when the wind of God broods over the waters, giving them their generative power. We see it later in the book of Ezekiel, when the Spirit blows through the valley of dry bones, bringing them back to life. The Spirit descends on Christ at his baptism, anointing him and empowering him to heal and to speak with authority. We see it again in the accounts of Christ's resurrection, the Spirit being mentioned as the power by which Christ was raised from the dead. And of course, as we celebrated recently, the Spirit is extended to Christ's disciples, raising them to new life as well in the world, giving them the ability to take the message of Christ out and spreading it to others. Talk of the Spirit runs the risk of becoming nebulous. Though the relationship of the Father and the Son is a mystery, we understand something of those terms, or at least we think that we do. But what can be called the effect of the Spirit? What can't be called the effect of the Spirit? How is such talk regulated? How does it not become the means by which we ascribe theological import to every one of our passing moods? Though it isn't stated explicitly, the Creed indicates that we speak correctly about the Spirit when we understand the Spirit as the power by which we are drawn to Christ, the power by which we are conformed to Him. The Spirit draws the whole world to Christ in advance of His coming by speaking about Him through the prophets. And the Spirit draws believers to Christ after His resurrection and ascension through baptism, through their incorporation into the life of the Church. Indeed, those final sentences of the Creed the ones about baptism, about the church, about resurrection, aren't simply tacked on like stray bits of the faith that have no good place to go. They are the very means by which the giver of life gives life. They are the means by which we are drawn into the life of God. They're the practical way that we get taken up into the reality of the very idea that we've just finished confessing when we complete the Nicene Creed. The doctrine of the Trinity begins with the Father and runs through the Son to the Spirit. But it could be argued that the experience of the life of faith runs in the opposite direction. We are awakened to new life by the Spirit and slowly over much time drawn into the life of the Son, into the position of the Son, and thus led back to the Father. In baptism, for example, the Spirit comes upon the water transforms it into the power by which we are incorporated into Christ's death, burial, and resurrection. And we could say similar things about the Eucharist and indeed about the life of the church as a whole. I've always appreciated that the creed ends with these references to the things that we do as a church. It brings the doctrine of the Trinity off the page and into our practices. It communicates that this doctrine must be lived uh, that we must grow into it. Though the world is full of heartache, we are called through our belief in the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, to witness to a counter-narrative with our lives, to enact that counter-narrative, to be evidence to others that the first and last word about the world is goodness. And in conformity to the Son, who for our sake was crucified under Pontius Pilate, we are asked to live in such a way that the pilots of the world will not be happy to have us around, to stand as Christ did with the people that the pilots of the world demean and exclude. And in the power of the Spirit, we are to do these things together, to grow into a body of believers, one that represents what society can and should be, a community of diverse people at peace with one another, who learn from one another and who humbly confess our sins together, a community willing to share this peace with the world at whatever cost. 
and as those who look forward to the life of the world to come, we are to do these things with confidence, without the loss of heart that seems a constant temptation these days. In the light of that hope, we're able to look for glimpses of that world even now, even in all of our stress and bewilderment and fear. And in our very looking for these glimpses, we are given the grace to become these glimpses of the world to come to others. Good morning. What a privilege it is to be with you all here today. I'm so excited that Jeff Vogel was able to talk about the theology of the doctrine of the Trinity uh, and give us a connection uh, such that when you say the creed after this homily, that you'll think of it hopefully in a new and uh, way uh, with a new depth. My job is to think about how the doctrine of the Trinity, while it might appear very abstract to you, actually has some really important practical implications for who we are as the body of Christ. So I'm going to make a claim to you today. My claim is that the doctrine of the Trinity gives us a model of community. And insofar as it does that, it gives us a vision of what the church is and what the church is becoming. It's a vision of what the church is and what the church is becoming. Now, to get to this, I think we need to learn a Greek term. And that term is perichoresis, perichoresis. It was one that was used all the way from ancient Greece all the way uh, through the patristic period. But most importantly, St. John of Damascus in the eighth century used this uh, to explain what he saw as the fullest expression of the relationship between the three persons of the Trinity who exist as three in one or a triunity. Now, I got to give you a warning. Before we jump into this, uh, I'm going to put the word up on the screen so that you can see it, you can write it down, and you can do your own research on it. Uh, but I'm going to warn you that website after website takes this term and they translate it as a dance, as if it were a circular dance. Uh, and, and I have to tell you that this is a common misconception, it would appear. Uh, it does not mean a circular dance. I love the metaphor. I think it's super great. However, there simply is no lexical warrant for this translation. Perichoresis doesn't mean to dance. It comes from the Greek word chorein, which means to give space or to make room, to yield, uh, to give away. And peri does mean around, right? To give space around. And I think that when we imagine what some of the early theologians, at least in the eighth century, were thinking about how to describe the Trinity, they understood that it was a dynamic receiving of one another as persons, thus creating a divine singularity, divine voice, maybe a concert, symphony, something to that effect. It was circular in motion, meaning that it was unified. But it was a mutual giving away, an interconnectedness that one would have. Whenever I deal with the idea of mystery, I have to say that turning to art is maybe one of the most important things. That can be literature, that can be painting, that can be drawing, that can be music, uh, it could be theater. There are so many different ways in which art allows us to approach as human beings beyond simple rationality to try to get a handle on what might be going on. So I just mentioned the idea of a symphony. And maybe a symphony is too much, but let's talk about a cantata. I want to talk about Johann Sebastian Bach, who, by the way, is a stunning musical theologian. So often, 
he is able to evoke the idea of a theological uh, concept in a way that words fail us. In one of his cantatas that he did for Trinity Sunday, we get a sense of what this might be. In this cantata, we get the very idea of connectedness that early church theologians, I think, were going for. Bach is actually using a hymn that was written by Johann Alaris. Uh, Alaris uh, and by the way, we have one of those hymns in our uh, hymnal, if you want to go look it up. Uh, not this one. What Bach does so well building on Alarius's hymn is that we get individual praise first to the Father, in the next verse, the Son, and then the third verse, the Holy Spirit. And then in the fourth, of course, it's to the Trinity as a whole. But in the fifth verse, which is a chorale that Bach has made here, what he has done is he explains that there is an invitation to us. This is where we become included. We respond to the interconnectedness of the Trinity. And so the verse is, to whom we now let holy ring forth with joy, and with the throng of angels sing, holy, holy, who is heartily honored and praised by all of Christendom. Praised be my God in all eternity. Take a listen to the hymn. So which voice or which instrument did you think was most important? The truth is they were all important and everybody gave space around to allow everyone to be in concert. It's not a symphony, technically speaking, it's a cantata, but you get the point that it is a voice together, a sound together. And there's not one voice that is being put forward, but it's every voice that's being put forward. I'm gonna guess that it's not one of your pastimes to be looking at ancient heresies, uh, but sometimes they're extremely useful for giving us uh, a, uh, I, I guess I would say a texture for understanding what's at stake for folks. So for example, uh, one that I want to talk about right now is called Sibelianism, or in the late 19th century, they called it modalism. Essentially, the argument was that uh, when God acted like a creator, God had on a father mask. When God acted like a redeemer, God had on a son mask, S-O-N. 
or when God was acting in a sustaining or a sanctifying way, God had a Holy Spirit mascot. The upshot here is that the persons themselves were really masks, they weren't real. There was only one individual or one thing that was behind it. In other words, it promoted the oneness of God over and against the threeness of God. Later theologians, in particular Maximus Confessor, argued that one of the reasons this is problematic is that each person in the Trinity participates in all the energies and activities of God. We're getting our symphony metaphor again, it seems to me, or at least it's my metaphor, not theirs. So we run across this sometimes when we rightfully try to use gender neutral language in the liturgy. I support that, and most of the time there's absolute textual warrant for that, I might add. However, when we reduce God to, or the persons of the Trinity to particular activities, creator, redeemer, sustainer, it's not that that statement is false, it's just simply incomplete. Rather, all persons of the Trinity participate in creation. All persons of the Trinity participate in redemption. All persons of the Trinity participate in the sustaining and sanctifying life that is given from God. Now, they participate in that differently. In other words, space is made for their persons to participate in the grand theological symphony, the salvific symphony, if you will. That has implications for us. What is your gift? It is not small. And the beauty of it is, is not only is your gift important and needed, it's welcomed in the way that you will give it. I think it's really important for us to know that we are invited to participate in the church who is invited to mirror and participate in God, God's self. This is the problem when we buy into something like Sibelianism. We realize that we suggest that some people have more important gifts than others, as opposed to all of them being part of the body of Christ that connect together. We are all part insofar as we follow the divine will in the creative act. We are all insofar as we connect ourselves to the divine will, to the salvific act. And we are all insofar as we are in concert with the Holy Spirit in the sanctifying act, bringing us all together. The invitation of God is to make space to let us come in, in the same way that God as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit allow one another space to be and to speak as one. Our invitation is we can do that. I challenge you if not, ask you, what is your gift and give it? Because God accepts it and gives space for it to come. And you can be part of that. And in being part of that, can be part of the divine plan itself. The Trinity is not just a random abstract doctrine. It is a recognition of the way in which community works and an invitation that no matter who you are and what your gifts are, we need and want and welcome those to be part of the divine plan. Our nation is in turmoil right now. We have been stricken with COVID-19, we find ourselves disconnected in ways that we never understood 
prior to the pandemic, we have seen unimaginable police brutality against persons of color that have been going on for decades. And there have been protests because of the death of George Floyd within the past week. What would it mean for us to imagine something like perichoresis? I am fond of Mauro Guevara's statement when he says that social movements are powered in no small part through radical leaps of imagination, a building of a collective narrative of a world that none of us has lived in, but long for. What would it mean to make space around yourself so that others might flourish? What would it mean to make space around yourself so others might flourish. It's different than calling for our rights. I have a right not to wear a mask, but I also have the ability to be better. Not for me, but for my neighbor. When we think about what would it have meant in Minneapolis, if space had been around to allow people to flourish. We have glimmers of what things might be. I'm thinking of Flint, Michigan. And by the way, if any place in the nation, and there are many places that have every right as they have to protest the evil that they have experienced, Flint, Michigan, We, we had a government hide the fact that they were essentially poisoning the water to save a buck of their citizens. If anyone or any group of people have a reason to be distrustful of government and government entities as the citizens of Flint, Michigan, when they went to protest the death of George Floyd, they were met by the sheriff's department ready for a riot. And in an interesting moment, the sheriff put down his baton and he walked over to the protesters and he gave space to hear them. And more importantly, they gave space for him to do what was right. What did that mean? It meant that Sheriff Chris Swanson, I don't believe he's related to our Chris Swanson, but I guess I don't know. Sheriff Chris Swanson made space to hear with the hope that others would flourish. And they, in response, made space and allowed him to march with them. They chanted, march with us, march with us. And you know what he did? He said, okay, where are we going? He didn't say we're going to this place. He said, where are we going? I'm with you. Now these are glimpses. Is the radical imagination of making space around so that others will flourish? going to work immediately? No. Is it something that is worth imagining and trying to put into action? Yes. It's the call of the gospel. Ask yourself this week, how will I make space around me to allow others to flourish? And then pray that God gives you the strength and the 
courage to do it. This is our call, and it's the model that we have in the Trinity. It's a model of mutual deference because of love. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please join together as we affirm our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made, and for our salvation he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshiped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. The prayers of the people. O oh God, our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble, in this challenging and uncertain time of global pandemic and public health crisis, we come before you offering our prayers on behalf of those in need, the church and the world. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For the church, that it may not grow weary of proclaiming the gospel of Christ and serve as a beacon of hope in a suffering world. We pray for Michael, our presiding bishop, Susan, our bishop, Nancy, our rector, Carolyn, our assisting priest, Helen, our campus minister, and all those who minister in your name. Lord, in your mercy, hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. For all affected by the coronavirus around the world, for the leaders of the nations that they may work together for the common good as the outbreak spreads. May barriers that divide be brought down and that bonds of trust may be strengthened to benefit the entire human family. Lord, in your mercy, hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. Grant public health and government officials in our nation the strength and will to act swiftly and decisively with wisdom and compassion and service to all. We pray especially for Donald, President of the United States, Congress, governors, and elected officials in local municipalities. Lord, in your mercy, hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. For healthcare workers who with hearts of service stand on the front lines of providing care, grant them courage and protection as they put the needs of the public safety before their own. Lord, in your mercy, hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. Remove the presence of fear and anxiety from our hearts that confident in your providence we may be generous in sharing our resources. Lord, in your mercy, hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. For the hope and comfort of the Holy Spirit, for those whose lives are overshadowed by illness or pain, for those whose lives are darkened by sorrow or bereavement, especially Charles, Jan, David, Barbara, Bill, Geraldine, Marshall, Thomas, Caitlin, Peyton, Christy and Tim, Gwen, Tom, Chester, Jennifer, Gail, Mara, Rick, Kim, Martha, Glenna, Caroline, Jennifer, and Kelsey. Lord, in your mercy, hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. For all who have died in the hope of the resurrection and those whose faith is known to you alone, that with all the saints, they may have rest in that place where there is no pain or grief, but life eternal. Lord, in your mercy, hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. 
a prayer for the power of the Spirit among the people of God. God of all power and love, we give thanks for your unfailing presence and the hope you provide in times of uncertainty and loss. Send your Holy Spirit to enkindle in us your holy fire. Revive us to live as Christ's body in the world, a people who pray, worship, learn, break bread, sharing life, heal neighbors, bear good news, seek justice, rest, and grow in the spirit. Wherever and however we gather, unite us in common prayer and send us in common mission that we and the whole creation might be restored and renewed through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Lord Jesus Christ, you said to your apostles, peace I give to you, my own peace I leave with you. Regard not our sins, but the faith of your church, and give to us the peace and unity of that heavenly city, where with the Father and the Holy Spirit you live and reign now and forever. Amen. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you. Forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ. Strengthen you in all goodness and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen.
Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And now may the peace of God that passes all understanding keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of His Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, and the blessing of God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you and remain with you always. Amen. Thank you for joining us this morning. And we look forward to seeing you again. Have a wonderful day. What a fellowship, what a joy divine we on the everlasting arms. What a peace is mine, leaning on the everlasting arms, leaning, leaning, safe and secure from all Yeah.